welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of All Things Policy. I'm Anu and with me I have Shida and Sudesha. You know us from the 20 Million Jobs Project at Takshashila. And today we're talking about something that's on everyone's minds. Election season's on us. Uh, 2024 is coming up. Shida, you live in Bangalore. Karnataka is going to election soon. So we thought, why don't we combine two of our favorite topics? Jobs and what's on our mind, which is election. Let's kick it off. Let's talk about who cares about jobs? Is this an election issue? Will this be a big issue in 2024? Sridhar, what do you think? Okay, in Karnataka, when I look at uh, what the political parties are saying, right? If, if, if we believe that the political parties have a pulse of the voters and they know what helps win elections, other than Rahul Gandhi and uh, Priyanka Gandhi when they visit Karnataka, no one else seems to be talking about jobs. So that's something that I noticed. The Congress does sort of talk about jobs. They talk about like, you know, how they're going to do it. But they also talk about unemployment, dole, etc. Not really about actions to create jobs. So number While uh, BJP and uh, JDS, they're not like really talking about jobs. They're talking about many other issues. And I think corruption is a big issue in the elections uh, in Karnataka. They, at least people are talking about it. It's not as though corruption doesn't exist in other states of our country or that one party is more corrupt than the other. But at least like, you know, the, the incumbent always gets dinged for corruption much more than anyone else. So there is that, which is a big issue. There is also this whole concept of caste politics and the caste politics in Karnataka seems to be fairly complex. I was watching a, an episode by Shekhar Gupta a while back where he talked about, he explained this sort of complex structure of caste politics in Karnataka and which party has which support of which community and so on. So that seems to be an issue that identity, the caste, the caste identity, etc. seems to be something that uh, these parties are playing on. There's also this conversation around, um, what do you say? So about infrastructure, I think that's another thing which people talk worry about in terms of roads, etc. But I was also reading some other articles which sort of contradict this. But at least parties are talking about the development they've done, they've done or development that needs to be done. So, so those are the things that people are saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. Like you're saying in Karnataka, of course, this doesn't seem to be top of mind. But as you said, uh, opposition seems to be, you know thinking about this issue and trying to spin it up into a narrative. I was actually reading a few articles and I think the uh, something that we said on this podcast a lot is the jury's really out there on what jobs they are even just, right? I think looking at the most recent unemployment data that we see from CMIE, we're at a three-month high of 7.8% in March. Uh, we were discussing before this, unemployment seems to disproportionately impact the youth particularly right now. And the BJP does seem to be thinking about it as we go into polls. In the budget session and the budget podcast that we did, we had a bet on how many times they would mention jobs. And uh, we believe it's the highest. And there was, that was really a focus, right? And there has been internal conversations last year as well at the BJP where um, they've actually looked at how do we fill in government positions uh, better? And the Rosgar Mela as well has become a big talking point. So it definitely seems to be something that they're thinking about, but more to blunt the opposition's, you know, narrative as well. So Disha, what do you think? Yeah, so one point that I wanted to make was, and just going back to the theoretical concepts a bit, it's about the Overton window, which is the range of acceptable government policies, right? Um, and the fact that, a lot of these things are being done by the government right now, which are related to jobs. For example, the policy of filling 1 million government vacancies before the 2024 elections, for example. The organization of those Garmelas that's happening all across the country. The fact that skill development is the, is the buzz phrase for the recent budget, right? There's a, there's a huge... Um, I would say the government really wants to focus on skill development, right? To increase the skill of the labor market in India. So these things are being done. And when you realize 
politics on a large scale, it's actually a performance, right? The government doesn't really have our interests in mind. It's not benevolent actions, right? What what parties care about is winning elections. What parties care about is staying in power, right? Um, so when these things are being done, we can assume that the public does indeed want to do something about the unemployment problem. The public is, in fact, demanding jobs. So I think it's fair to assume that somewhere the public wants that and that's why the government is taking on these measures. So we can assume that while unemployment may not be the biggest issue for the upcoming elections, it is definitely something that the public cares about. Yeah, I mean, definitely public cares about unemployment. The question comes down to, like, I care about many things, but what will I vote for, right? So I think that's, that's really it. It's not that people don't care if they don't have a job. Of course, it's something that affects them personally and deeply. The other thing that I was reading while researching for this uh, discussion, I was reading some interesting articles. And there is a, an Oxford University scholar by name Tanushri Goel. And she's done a deep study on do citizens enforce accountability for public goods uh, provision. She basically, you, you, you made a point, Sadisha, that, you know, governments are uh, eventually a care about being voted back to power and will do things that will help them to win elections again. And if they are talking about jobs and trying to work on the economy, etc., it will get rewarded in the ballot, right? And that's the view and that's a general observation across developed nations, at least. Countries that do well do get vote. I mean, governments that do well in, with economics do tend to get re-elected. In 1992, for instance, Bill Clinton mentioned when he was asked, like, what about this, that, that? He said, it's the economy stupid, right? Basically, if you do well at the economy, people will vote you back to power. If you screw up on that, they will not. How were the data in India, according to Tanushri Goel, does not sort of uh, support that idea. And it seems to indicate that, like, you know, people in India do, do not care about the economic growth. She took roads as a sort of proxy for public good provisioning and performance of a government. And she said from 1998 onwards, through the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, which was launched by Vajpayee in 2000, she studied elections between 1998 and 2017. She looked at the number of roads. I mean, we have built 5,50,000 kilometers of road in that period. And in India, we spent 28 million crores to do this. We have connected 200,000 villages across India with, with roads, right? But she shows, shows that like 14 election results she studied during this period and found that there is no correlation between the development done, the roads built, etc. and like, you know, election outcomes. So that's something that she, she saw. There are people who sort of um, also contradict this view and say that like, you know, that may not really be true. Maybe people do care about like development, but they don't know who to give credit for. Like, do you give credit to this local politician? Do you give credit to the state government or do you give credit to the central government? People rarely know who's responsible for what in their sort of neighborhoods. Very few people do that. Only one to two percent of our Indians study the party's election manifesto, according to this study. Very few people are even aware of what uh, governments are doing. Uh, but there are others who believe that this is a trend which is changing. So, but yeah, to your point, development may not automatically leave. There are good examples of like, say, Chandra Babu Naidu in Andhra Pradesh, where it was universally accepted that there was a lot of economic development and growth in his period, but he lost an election. And um, there are cases I know when even in Tamil Nadu, for instance, development doesn't seem to matter because each they just keep switching between one party and the other across the various elections. Sometimes the DMK wins, sometimes the next time the ADMK wins and so on. That's been largely the trend, um, except uh, every now and then it's sort of there are terms when like people have like two, two tenures like, and all that. And uh, so this is this is what we're seeing. I mean, like, you know, is this true that economic development doesn't have a... But then there's Milan Vaishnav feels that, you know, in the 120 elections between 1980 and 2012, there was low correlation between economics and elections. But in the last decade, but this may be shifting and people may be caring more about economic development today than they did in the past. So 
let's see. The last two years and whether elections have been uh, an issue, and we found out that unemployment is simply not a decisive election issue, right? So the RBI claims data shows that jobs grew at an annual average rate of 2.3% when Vajpayee was the PM. Um, that was twice the rate at which labor force was growing, and yet the NDA got voted out in 2004, and it was the converse for the UPA government who came back into power, even though jobs were not growing. So it'll be interesting to see what might cause this switch uh, as to why people would start voting. Um, and and also the other thing that we were discussing earlier was the fact that jobs disproportionately impact the youth. Uh, of all the missing voters that we have um, in India, a big proportion of that is young people. Um, and also they don't tend to be the decision makers in their family structures. Right? So even though it might impact them deeply, a lot of these young men who are impacted by job loss or lack of employment uh, tend to still live at home with their parents uh, or with parental figures who are the decision makers and are not as impacted. Um, and therefore, their voting decisions also tend to be centered around that. Now, this is what the theory has been for the past few years, but we are curious to see if that changes with rising unemployment. And just another example, you since you spoke about Karnataka, Himachal is one state that I actually look to for a uh, better understanding of what may be done differently. Uh, because that's the state that BJP lost. And I think one of the big issues there was unemployment and BJP's lack of specific local policies that would actually help, right? Things like uh, levying a tax on apple picking and apple packaging materials, which would really hurt the state as well. Uh, and even the Agnipat scheme, because a lot of people from Himachal tend to actually want to go into the Indian army. So there was this, uh, essentially the national... Uh, narrative didn't really work because the local issue was jobs and unemployment of the other things as well. So that's it. Yeah. That I thought saying sting piece. One thing that I do feel, Anu, is that, you know, while jobs are important, there are a couple of things. I think we'll find out very soon whether jobs really matter or not. 2024 elections will show us what it says because there is data, like when you looked at the CMIE data, there was, we also did a podcast on that a few uh, months back. When we talked about the rising unemployment amongst the youth, while unemployment in India has gone up, it's the highest it's been for a long time. We are at 7.8, It's sort of been varying in that, in, that, in that zone for a bit. But the unemployment amongst the young has been like very high at like almost close to 30%. Now, when you have that level of unemployment amongst the, amongst the youth, and we have a large young population of voters, don't you think they might sort of ignore their parental advice and go on and say, hey, I mean, this government is not doing something that I need desperately for my self-respect within the home. And um, I'm staying with my parents. Maybe I'm not starving, but like, you know, if I had a job, I could be more independent and I could take my decisions better. And I want a government that comes back to power, that comes to power, which will give me jobs. So, I don't know. Because Congress is talking about jobs in, in, in Karnataka. And uh, for more reasons than one, there are people are saying that Congress might win the election this time. right? So, if the Congress does win, then somebody might believe that it's because of jobs. But in reality, it could be because of multiple things. So, people don't vote only for one thing. right? Isn't that also true? While jobs may be important for some people, they may vote on... They might also be influenced by uh, which caste they belong to or like you know whether this infrastructure around my in my community or it's like you know my, my uh, do we have self-respect do we i mean the fact that karnataka's flag is not apparently being approved is an issue for uh, i mean so people are clutching at straws right i mean in terms of like various ideas you bring about you just talk about what this government is not doing right in order the opposition just tries to do that but people will care about what they care about. And then I think maybe there is a structural change and maybe people will care more about some of these real issues going forward. But today, so far, I have not seen evidence of that. Yeah, I think you, you were talking about also how, uh, I, I don't know, actually, from Takshila as well, had said that what of reference can be viewed as a hierarchy of needs with individual benefits on top, followed by community benefits and largely benefits, lastly, sorry, benefits from public goods. So voters, if benefits are kind of dispersed, then voters don't see it as personal gains, right? So 
they're not actually thinking about a newly constructed road when they're th- when they're voting or when they're pressing that i like i can in the on the evm but of the individual gains which is why in the end it always comes down to freebies and freebies tend to rule the election cycle in the end, closer to the actual date right and we tend to see a lot of narratives interesting point on whether people will actually care about what we perceive to be the real issues but like you said attribution is really hard we're all intersectional in our identities and therefore what we care about and what actually becomes the voting what we vote on is deeply personal but i think it's it's just something that we've spoken about so much if unemployment is such a big concern shouldn't it become a big issue that people vote on because they deeply care about it so let's take a break and then come back and discuss a little bit more about what we would actually like to see from these parties uh, in this election cycle when it comes to skilling jobs and unemployment and we're back All right, folks. So, do you have a wish list that uh, we can send over to all these parties who are obviously listening to this podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I think like you know, two, three things. One, we need these uh, labor law reforms to be made into laws in different states. There seems to be a lot of uh, opposition to many of the states coming up. I mean, like uh, Tamil Nadu has come up with this law, uh, with this uh, new labor law, and that's sort of put on hold because there's a lot of opposition from the labor unions. on it etc so i think if we do want jobs and you want more manufacturing jobs our labor reforms which have been initiated need to sort of get become law and like you know things need to move on i think that's an important one which governments need to sort of do the second thing they need to do is around um, i think the union government is talking about it these days in terms of uh, ensuring that msmes get paid on time one of the biggest reasons for msmes uh failing or becoming bankrupt and all that is is because they don't get paid by their uh, customers on time the customers are typically large companies public sector and takings and so on and uh, they don't pay these people and they don't have enough liquidity to last so ensuring that msmes get paid on time is a is a big one to ensure that uh, that vibrant part of that economy that we have uh, continues to be there and continues to grow we need but i think the most important thing i think we're doing a lot of stuff in terms of infrastructure development i think we need to increase the pace of doing some of these things and like what we're doing is too little too late but never better late than never and i do feel that we need to increase the pace of infrastructure development there is more money which has been allotted to capital expenses uh, expenditure in the current budget there are signs that even the private sector might start increasing its investment in in capex because uh, utilization rates have gone up in the plants and so on so therefore there is uh, there are signs that that might happen but there is recession looming across the globe so i think like uh, we we need to be able to as a nation we are fortunate that we have about 65 70% of our economy's domestic demand and therefore like you know we can do something locally which will benefit job creation but the biggest one and the one that i feel that we should focus on is about upskilling and i don't talking about upskilling and doing something real about it are two different things and uh, i think we need to have more sustainable means of finan- identifying the right skills that are required and being able to finance the upskilling of people to be able to take on the right jobs and uh, that part i i feel is a is a big one completely lacking and uh, has not really got the attention of people people still think that the government can decide uh, that these are some 20 new skills that are required everybody says okay now we must all learn, learn ai because some 3 million new jobs are going to come in ai and so on but uh, maybe it's true i mean i i'm i'm a big uh, believer in what ai and can do in terms of creating new jobs but also it's going to disrupt a lot of jobs and we need to be able to have the right skills to get new jobs so that's my biggest concern and i need to see i'd like to see the political parties and the governments uh seized of the matter and and do something about it yeah. so so dicha did you have anything that you want to see featured on these manifestos yeah no, i think uh, just a very simple point that I think for a few decades now we've focused on just growth 
So there's lot there's been a lot of talk about growth and economic growth and GDP and all. I think it's a it's about time that governments and even citizens like us start focusing on growth with job creation. That's very important. And you know, I, I wanna just re like quote Anupam uh, when he came to our podcast once. He said that it's not the government's responsibility to create jobs. That it can be a, like a temporary fix. It can be a band aid to a large wound. But uh, but in the long run, we need to have a system where there are enough jobs for all the unemployed people. The governments do not have to take desperate measures in order to uh, fill vacancies or something like that. What needs to happen is that once a person graduates from their school or college, they should be skilled enough to compete in the labor market. And there should be enough jobs for them to absorb. And that can that that ecosystem can only be created when several factors are at play. And that could be some of the points that Shida highlighted that MSMEs should be given credit, that, that there should be skill development courses available for people, right? Uh, that private companies should get the ecosystem to thrive, that there should be a reduction of red tape and ease of business policies that should be implemented. So a lot of factors will have to act in tandem in order to, in order for us to have an ecosystem where uh, jobs are organically created, and uh, that's, I think that that's something that should be focused on the upcoming manifestos. That we don't just concentrate on growth alone; we concentrate on growth with job creation. I echo everything that you both said. Just the two more things that I would love to see, and perhaps I'm not sure if the right space for it is the manifestos, but I would love to see a focus on sustainable job creation as well and I don't just mean green jobs but also how do we actually make sure like Sudesha, Sudesha said it's not a temporary fix we're creating an environment for jobs to grow um, and along with sustainability I think a big portion of our uh, jobs today come from agriculture um, and as we start to think about climate change and the real impact it's going to have in the next few years on productivity as well it's important that we think about how we are able to skill people correctly and also create sustainable agriculture options uh, that that work for uh, the long term. And then finally, I'd also love to see just personally a focus yeah. on bringing more women into the labor force and keeping them there. Uh, again, it's something that we've spoken about a lot, but um, there definitely needs to be an effort on all sides, not just from corporate India. And I would love to see your party actually talk a little bit more about how do you create uh, structural skilling initiatives that help women stay in the labor force as well. So, yeah, lots of wishes from us, uh, but it remains to be seen if 2024 will actually be dominated by jobs as a narrative. Will it actually even play a role? Uh, we'll be watching the upcoming state elections. And then, yeah, the jury is out, as we said. Yeah, I think like we should be optimistic about it. I think uh, as India sets its goal towards becoming a developed nation by 2047, I think we need to, obviously these things have to, we want growth with equity, with uh, with jobs. And India needs to like, you know, we need, to, I look at this idea of making India becoming Atmanirbhar. When you look, when we start talking about it, what we are trying to say is we want to be self-sustaining. We don't need to, we shouldn't be dependent on other people for what we produce. But I think really what we should do is that the world is a large place. We can't produce everything in India competitively. We should figure out what are the few things at which we can be as a nation competitive. And like, you know, ensure that those industries and those spaces are given the ecosystem that... Uh, allows them to, to thrive. So if like, you know, we we, are, we have skills in IT, then can we ensure that the IT industry is not crippled with some over, too much over regulation, et cetera, and like allows them to sort of move up the value chain, uh, focus on AI, do product development, uh, build large platforms, which are going to be applicable internationally, rather than saying today we will have like a, a social media network, which is purely Indian, which is meant for India and we shouldn't be dependent on something internationally, right? So I feel while we talk about growth with jobs and we talk about doing it sustainably, I think this is important. 
it will be sustainable only if we are truly competitive globally in in those industries in which we try to grow and uh, we need to build that kind of we need to say make in india not just to become atmanirbhar but make in india for the world but make what we can do well at yeah i think that's 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 the most important thing i yeah. think if we do that make well we'll get we know get how there. to make in india for the world maybe someone would like to use that tagline yeah <laughs> <laughs> well on that note yeah. thanks for the chat everyone and uh, we'll see you on our next episode with uh, more about jobs thank you thanks anil thanks to disha yeah, thank you if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in